Welcome back to another episode of Becoming a Techno Wizard. Uh, we are continuing on the same day, um, September 18th, 10, oh goodness, 11.52 a.m. <laughs> and uh, this time we're going to continue our series on Hegel, learning about a reading and learning about the phenomenology of spirit. So we are now on section 39, or part 39, sections uh, 90 through 93. And in the last sections, which is the end of the introduction of the phenomenology, this today we're going to get into chapter one. But in the last sections of the introduction, Hegel explains how and why science is the experience of consciousness. He shows how consciousness allows us to grasp concepts that are subsumed by the evolution of those concepts that perceive them. At the end of the process, or perhaps at a certain vantage point, uh, we can incorporate that which seemed alien or other into our understanding of ourselves. He shows how our everyday experiences can really be seen as a dialectical process, since every time we come up against a new concept, we naturally try to fit it into our pre-existing concepts. This induction it is, is described as a reversal of consciousness and even happens on a societal level through history. At least that's how I uh, summarize the last section. Let's see how Dr. Sattler did it. So Dr. Sattler summarizes the last section as follows. He said, Hegel now considers an objection that could be raised about the nature of experience. In our ordinary life, it does not appear that our own consciousness work out that work our own consciousnesses work out their relations with the objects of knowledge in the dialectical manner outlined in the previous paragraphs. Instead of simply having one object worked upon and revealed to an object in, an, in an object in itself and also an object in itself and for consciousness, it seems that experience really involves running, running across second objects that are revealed to us contingently by chance externally to whatever dialectical process is occurring. This is only an appearance, however, and according to Hegel, what transpires is really a reversal of consciousness in which the new second seemingly unrelated or contingent object is taken up into the dialectic. In fact, this has been occurring throughout human history, and we are now at the point where we are able to observe these new developments of consciousness, but from the vantage point of the finished process. Oh, does it continue? Oh, it does. <laughs> that is indeed what the phenomenology of spirit is supposed to provide us with, a systematic scientific perspective upon the totality, the all, which is thoroughly permeated with human consciousness. Accordingly, the dialectical path to science turns out to be science itself. Awesome. Yeah. So he had a much more comprehensive summary. <laughs> I like his. That was great. But without further ado, let's jump into it. Shall we? <laughs> Ooh. The pop today. The knowledge. I gotta look these songs up. They they're pretty dope, you know. I don't go to classical music too much, but I do like it. Um specifically I like the dynamics and what I really love, and this is gonna be probably, you know, uh uh heretical to, to some people who like classical music but i like it when it's remixed with new stuff like rap or um um edm all right hear me out hear me out like check out some somebody like uh del the funky homo sapien i think that's his name he has this great song let me see if i can find it real quick i know we're, we're going on for tangent here but you know while i'm on the topic i gotta i gotta i gotta um give an example here Mo sapien uh shoot what is the song called empire back it's crazy he has like some uh some choral chorus like um choral chorus like epic <laughs> orchestral type of stuff in the beginning i'm gonna have to find it later but another one is uh apashi or page i don't know how you say his name um, he has a bunch of these he, do, he does all the time, like, you know, Lacrimosa, things like that. Let me see if I can share this new tab while I'm here. I don't know if this will get my, my thing messed up, though. Can I do like a, a few seconds? Hopefully. Hello. 
All right, let me stop. <laughs> but he he does this whole thing like he he takes some of the like the old act old orchestral kind of stuff and then remixes it and adds some bass and the bass lines and all this other stuff and it's just so epic to me. Another one is um two steps from hell. They don't take old orchestral music, but it sounds like so epic and orchestral. I really love that stuff. Um, there's a couple other rappers that do, you know, that have some songs with like these remixes in there, but uh, yeah, it's, it's dope. I love it. Anyways. Sorry. Sorry. Let me. <laughs> mm. Interesting. I talked a lot. So let me just. <laughs> At least we think so.
Okay, so before I get in, a couple couple of thoughts on this. Definitely a very interesting start. Um, you know, that the attempt to start at the beginning and you know, the beginning meaning as with our perceptions, right? And I think that makes sense. But what got me thinking is like, is that the beginning, right? Especially in terms of how we come uh, um understand the world and, and perceive the world, right? Like maybe you can start uh, in the beginning of evolution, right? <laughs> With uh, like, we could try to imagine, you know, how bacteria would <laughs> would see the world or perceive things, right? Uh, but that might be going too far. But even if you start with like uh, as a baby, right? How 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 does babies see the world? Like, how do they perceive things, right? Because I think what he's getting into here is that we we like to think that the pure um, perception, right? The pure sense of things when we just see an object before we even think too much about it is, is our raw, you know, unfiltered, you know, experience that it alters nothing, all this other stuff. But I think what he's going to go into is that, no, it doesn't. Like it, as soon as we perceive something or the very act of perceiving something requires us to alter it in some way, right? Requires us to put a filter in some way, right? Because we're filtering out certain information. We're filtering in other information just based on the, how what our, bio, what our biology allows, right? So it's from the very beginning, you're already, you know, um, biased in some way. You're already altering in some way. You're already, you know, comprehending it in some way. So I wonder, you know, where it's going to lead. But I think this is this is what this part is kind of building up to. Um, but nonetheless, I still will. I really would would be curious to see, you know, if we can do a sort of phenomenal phenomenological <laughs> um, <clears throat> kind of experience by starting with, you know, a, a child, a baby. You know, uh, how do they perceive the world? Because they may when I mean, they look at, you know, this thing. They don't have an idea of a cup, right? That doesn't come to them. They have to, they they might, they have to associate that with the action, with what it does based on what other people are doing it for and, what, and how they use it, right? So that could be a good way of starting from the beginning of looking, observing children, you know, seeing how they learn about objects and perceive them and use them and things like that and see how that shifts into how we use it today. Um, another example is maybe even other animals, right? Just was it yesterday or something like that? I read an article where they figured out how to <laughs> how to put dogs in a. I still knew it two dogs for this study, but it was like a proof of concept. But they figured out how to put dogs in those uh, machines that are, so they can read their brain signals, and they can actually they had they prepared some videos for them, and had um you know just sit and watch the videos. So they had to train them to, you know, sit and watch for for thirty minutes. But they just sat and watched the videos, and they could scan their brain to see, you know, what parts of their uh, brain was activating when they looked at different scenes. And so they can figure out how how dogs were thinking. And they figured out, or they saw so far, um, that dogs seem to, you know, bias towards action versus objects. Right. So you know, more things get activated in their neurons and stuff like that in their brain. Um, when there's action on a screen versus when there's just an object on the screen and a bunch of other stuff. But that's the side of, sort of thing that I think is really interesting in terms of, you know, this, 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 uh, this uh, phenomenology, right? The beginning, like how does, how does our perceptions change us and how do we change the world based on our perception? So a bunch of thoughts that came to mind when I was, when I was listening to this, but uh, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Let's, let's get further into it. <laughs> Please tell me the volume is going. I don't see the volume thing. Oh my gosh. Let me check. I really hope this volume is playing, y'all. I'm going to be mad. I mean, you could read on the screen. So that's the biggest thing you'll miss is my own commentary. Oh, well, no, you I'm should hear my mad. commentary. Okay. Okay, so before I get a couple couple of thoughts on this. So this uh 
this uh, phenomenology. Oh no, you can't. I'm so sorry. I have to reshare the screen one second. Why does it do this? Why doesn't it automatically, you know, hit that tab, the share tab audio? Ugh, ugh. Try it again. I'm not restarting it, y'all. I'm sorry. You can go watch the video if you want to hear uh, Dr. Sattler's in the <laughs> words at the very beginning. Ah, oh, very unfortunate there. Well, I, I'll go back. I'll go back. Fine. Fine. I'll go back. And what kind of objects make the most sense for doing this? Why not begin with what seems to be most basic, phenomenology of spirit? Looking at this section up. called sense certainty. And why are we beginning there? Well, like I put here, shouldn't we begin at the beginning? This is the question that Hegel is posing for us. If we have gone through all of this sort of conceptual preparation in the preface and the introduction, and we arrived at the point where we realize that we need to be doing phenomenology, we need to allow things to present themselves to us, things that have already occurred, but which matter to us as, as subjects that can relive them, we need to have a kind of hands-off, passive attitude. And what kind of objects make the most sense for doing this? Why not begin with what seems to be most basic, the objects of sense, the things that we perceive? And this is where, indeed, um, much phenomenology begins with, thinking about a red ball or a green ball, all of which are all. But as Hegel's going to reveal to us, we're not really beginning at the beginning, because we never actually have a beginning to start from. It always turns out that this immediacy that we think that we have conceals the fact that there's mediation going on, and we will get to an end where everything has been connected together and all the mediations have been unveiled, but we have to actually start from somewhere. So instead of saying beginning, if you, if you want to quibble about this, we can call it a starting point, we commence the process. And the representation that we make to ourselves of what we're doing at the beginning is that consciousness has to be purely receptive. It, it takes in the object, as Hegel says, um, the knowledge that, that um, we're beginning with is immediate knowledge. That is knowledge that doesn't have anything standing in the way. And you might even say, in a certain respect, I'm, I'm already confusing things by showing this arrow here. What we really want to have is the object just right smack up against consciousness, presenting itself to it, and through the, the you know, the, you know, be careful, the medium of the senses. But think about what it's like when we're in the moment, when we're just paying attention to what's going on, when we feel that we are being just purely receptive. There's no distance. There's no filter between us and the world that we're experiencing. That is something that's quite attractive. So Hegel says, this is what we are going to begin with. It's going to turn out that that's not, a, you know, it's not measuring up to its own pretensions. Mm -hmm. The object presents itself to us as immediate. Nothing between us and it. Nothing intervening. Nothing filtering. Nothing conditioning it. As what simply is. Being. This is our raw, immediate, in-your-face encounter with beings as such. That's what's being presented here. And consciousness, then, has some jobs to do. Not only does it have to be purely receptive, it has to take care not to alter anything, not to bring too much of itself to the experience, to let the experience impinge upon, us, upon it, not to allow the experience to be conditioned or put into a framework by consciousness. So as Hegel will say, um, the translation here is a little bit, a little bit tricky. Um, what we want to do is not allow comprehension to stand in the place of apprehension. We want to distance those from each other. Comprehension here, the understanding in that sense, is begreifen, this conceptual knowledge that we've been talking about for so long. Begreifen. And what we want instead is a raw, pure, unadulterated auffassen, just auffassen. grabbing on to the thing itself, seizing hold of it. There's a little bit of, you know, trickery here because begreifen, you know, to, to grab, to grip, fassen, to, to, to grab onto as well, both ways we can, we can make sense of this. But the idea is that we as consciousness have a capacity for taking in what is coming to us from the object, what is coming to us through our senses, the experience that we take in. Mm. Good stuff. Because of its concrete content, sense certainty immediately appears as the richest kind of knowledge, indeed a knowledge of infinite wealth for which no bounds can be found, either when we reach out into space and time in which it is dispersed, or when we take a bit of this wealth and by division enter into it. Mm -hmm. Moreover, sense certainty appears to be the truest knowledge, for it has not as yet emitted anything from the object, but the, it has the object before it in its perfect entirety. But in the event, this very certainty proves itself to be the most abstract and poorest truth. Mm -hmm. All that it says about what it knows is just that it is. Mm. And its truth contains nothing but the sheer being of the thing. Mm -hmm. Consciousness, for its part, is, is in this certainty only a pure I, or I am in it only as a pure this. And mm. the object similarly only as a pure this. Mm. I, this particular I. Hello, hold on. Got to go back with that. This is, this is a good you know, way of thinking about it too, right? 
Um, like when we look at an object or a thing or whatever uh, concept, when we first see it for what it is, we just see it for what it is, right? And that may seem like a tautology, if, that, if that's the correct word there. But like the point is that like when we first see the concept, it, it is like, you know, oh, there it is. Okay. You see rain, you see uh, a wall, you see a cup, you see, you know, um, government or whatever, right? You're just looking at, it's basically looking at face value. But we all know that, or at least we should know, and you can't really take things at face value because it's almost always some more depth to it. There's almost always some more things to, to, to learn about it. Even a simple object, once again, like a cup, you know, um, you may think you understand it by just by just looking at it, but you don't know how was it made, who made it, you know, uh, what do you put on it? What do you put in it? Like, well, what is the best type of liquid to put in it? Can you heat it up? Can you, you know, freeze it? Can you put it in a freezer? You know, stuff like this. Like, you don't know these things until you delve deeper into it. Similarly, similarly for consciousness, right? In terms of how we view ourselves, right? This certainty only as a pure eye, right? You, we know that consciousness gives us this understanding of the eye, the self, but if we only take the self effort at face value, then we'll never understand more about ourselves. We just say, okay, I, I am. Okay. You know, <laughs> well, what now? Like you really want uh, to do more from that. Like, so you can't, it, it seems like the, the best truth because it's like, you see, you perceive and all this other stuff. But as we're coming to see, you know, it's important to, to delve deeper this and the object similarly only as a pure this i this particular i am certain of this particular thing not because i qua consciousness in knowing it have developed myself or thought about it in various ways and also not because the thing of which i am certain in virtue of a host of distinct qualities would be in its own self a rich complex of connections or related in various ways to other things neither of these has anything to do with the truth of sense certainty here, neither I nor the thing has the significance of a complex process of mediation. Mm -hmm. The I does not have the significance of a manifold imagining or thinking, nor does the thing signify something that has a host of qualities. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, the thing is, and it is merely because it is. It is, this is the essential point for self, for sense knowledge, and this pure being or simple immediacy constitutes its truth. Mm. Similarly, certainty as a connection is an immediate pure connection. Consciousness is I, nothing more, a pure this. The singular consciousness knows a pure this or the single item. Mm. Yeah. So like we, we just said. It doesn't said, take yeah. long for Hegel to start already engaging in some dialectical transformations where you thought things <laughs> were this way and they turn out to be this way. And in section 91, this is going to occur really in two important ways. So we begin from this conception, as he says, of sense certainty as being exactly what we were looking for. It's the richest kind of knowledge and it's the truest kind of knowledge. Let's look at how he makes that case, or rather doesn't make the case, but allows sense certainty itself and the way it works to make the case for it. And real quick, I do want to note that this is what well, this is actually to my knowledge, and I might be wrong about this, but I looked it up a little bit. Um, this seems to be a goodness, a real way of looking at human development, right? When when kids are young, um, they see the world from a perspective of, oh, that's that's the world, right? They set these rules for how they think the world works. So when they're learning, when they're young, right? Everything they see is they just taking it at face value because that's the only thing they can do, right? Take it at face value and they begin to form these connections and understandings of how the world works, right? So when it's, when you say, you know, this is what a dog is, this is what a cat is, you know, then you have this, okay, this certainty, this richness, this true um, uh, knowledge, or, or at least what you think it is. Um, and this is really important to note, right? Because this seems to align with our even modern day science on how development works and how we how we how our consciousness you know develops we start from this understanding this uh assumption that what we see is all there is to see what we see is the the richest the truest knowledge right but then of course as we grow older you begin to realize oh you know yeah that's a cat but a cat can also be this like a you know a lion or <laughs> you know if you mess around with it you can also make a cat look like a dog even though that might be hard and that might be weird, but technically you might be able to do it. And then you might be able to ask, okay, what does a cat mean in terms of the species or the gene or the family, all this other stuff, right? So you begin to learn that what you thought was the true, truest sense was was really not. Um, so yeah, that that was that's pretty interesting. So why is it the richest kind of knowledge? 
Well, the consciousness is relating itself to these objects, and the objects are impinging upon consciousness. And it can turn to any one of them that it wants to. He says that it's rich in that there's almost an infinity of possibilities as we range through space and time. Think about your, your sensible manifold as you're looking around. You know, I'm looking around in a room, and there are who knows how many thousand books in this room, each of which has its spine, some color, and I can range my eyes over any single one of them as I'm moving from object to object to object, or if I look at a spot on the chalkboard. Space and time offer me this infinite variety of spectacles to, to engage in. And even better, if I take any one given object and I sort of unpack it and look at it very closely, I can see more and more and more in it. I can take a piece of chalk like this that originally I just see as a, a tiny cylinder, and I notice that the bevels on it are at different angles. If I start paying attention to what I'm doing, um, mm -hmm. they do these, these sort of things in mindfulness exercises. I'm not going to mm -hmm. do this, but I mean, you can take this piece of chalk and stick it in your mouth as well <laughs> and start you know, experiencing it by taste. I won't do that because I did that as a kid, uh, and I found out I don't like chalk. Um, and you can let it linger. You know, they, they do this in mindfulness exercises quite often with food with a raisin. First, you're supposed to like touch it to your lip, and then you like put it on your tongue, and now you like let it linger, and then you bite into it, and you get the juicy, you know, sweetness of it. Well, okay, that's what he's talking about is an infinite variety, and this is all concrete. So this is why it's so rich, concrete as opposed to the abstract, as opposed to the general. You want to see what you know? Chalk, the hardness of chalk feels like. Squeeze a little bit in your hand, or you know, rub a bit on your finger and feel the dryness of it. You know, listen to the sound that it makes. That's all mm -hmm. concrete. That's all coming to us through our senses. So he says, um, because of its content, this is, is the richest kind of knowledge, a knowledge of infinite wealth for which no bounds can be found. You know, space and time, we can move around as much as we want in them. Time, you can say, all right, I'm going to stop perceiving right now. Ain't going to happen. I suppose if you, you know, gouge your eyes up, and even then your brain's going to be having some sort of sensory impressions of blankness or whatever it is that you see when you're not seeing anything. So he says, um, we can, buy, we can take a bit of this wealth and by division enter into it. That's what we're talking about is like looking at an object. You know, look at your hand. Notice the ink spots that I must have like touched the, the pen to myself. I can look at the <laughs> various colors. You know, and he's actually right. When we look at objects and we look at them carefully, they reveal all sorts of things to us mm -hmm. that we didn't originally think were there, mm -hmm. that we didn't really see. That's why when you're doing art, it's so important to be a good spectator, to really mm -hmm. see what's there. If I'm going to draw my hand, I need to look at where shadows actually fall, not just where I think they fall, mm -hmm. but where they actually do fall on the object that I'm perceiving. So it's the richest kind of knowledge. That's great. It's also the truest kind of knowledge. Why? Because it's not intervening. It's not taking anything from consciousness and imposing it on the object. It's not making objects line up with each other and compare against each other. It's not bringing any filters, any preconceptions, any structures to the object. It's just letting the experience happen. Letting the think so. sensory data flow over one so that you can just see what's there. So far, it sounds so pretty good. But Hegel's going to say, well, that's not actually what's going on. Because he says, in the, in the event, the very certainty proves itself to be the most abstract and porous truth. Mm -hmm. All that it says about what it knows is just that it is. So what we're getting with these objects is not really an object, per se, but just being. Mm. Just something that is. Because what does it mean for something to truly be an object? It means that it has qualities, a whole bunch of qualities. Mm. And we're going to see why this matters in a moment. Uh, and it also means that it relates itself to other objects, that it finds itself in a matrix with them, that it connects mm. itself with them, that it's not just something totally independent and on its own. For consciousness to experience that is for consciousness to experience an object as an object. He says, um, consciousness would perceive things as a batch of qualities, a rich complex of connections related in various ways to other things. So this isn't happening in sense certainty. Instead, consciousness is just being confronted with the raw being, what is, what, what lies in front of it, what impinges upon it. And consciousness reveals itself to us as being what Hegel calls the pure I. Because if it's just going to be receptive like that, it can't bring anything of itself and at least insofar as it is receptive for the person who's doing the perceiving, the person who's conscious, the only thing that matters is this, you know, you might say, ability to mirror what is out there, this mm -hmm. capacity to take in what's coming in from the outside and make that be what it is. So it can't have any qualities itself. It can't have any determinacy itself. It says consciousness is in this certainty only a pure I, or I am in it. Here's where it's really interesting. Only as a pure this. You can't even really call it an I, because that's already to ascribe it some sort of properties, some qualities, isn't it? Mm, this. That's a good point. That's all we got, is this. Now that's not very rich, is it? That's pretty <laughs> abstract. 
Mm-hmm. And it's not even giving us the truth of, say, consciousness, or the person, or the subject, or the truth of the object, or the truth of the relationship between them. It's just giving us this relationship between one this and another this. Mm. It's not telling us an awful lot anymore, is it? So here's where the dialectical transformation has taken place as we follow out what is actually entailed in sense certainty, in the operation of experience this way. He says, um, this, this particular I, I am certain of this particular thing. Not because I, qua consciousness, and knowing it, have developed myself, I've thought about it in various ways, that can't be going on if I want to stay in the moment, if I don't want to get away from this pure certainty that sense uh, is able to give me. As soon as I start thinking about it, I've lost it. I'm no longer in sense certainty. I may have a relationship to the object, and it may be a richer, truer relationship, but it's no longer the one of sense certainty. Mm. He says, um, in, in knowing it, I have developed myself or thought about it in various ways, and also not because the thing of which I'm certain would be in itself a rich complex of connections. Neither of these has anything to do with the truth of sense certainty. So sense certainty turns out to be something that we don't actually experience. It might be said to be rather imaginary. Mm. Because what we do experience is my thinking about things, or your thinking about things, as a determinate being, in determinate ways, over time, within space, in terms of something more than just this and this. This doesn't tell me anything, does it? So he says, on the contrary. The thing is, and it is merely because it is, it is, this is the essential point for sense knowledge, and this pure being, or simple immediacy, constitutes its truth. So the truth of sense certainty is not the fact that sense certainty is actually giving us an unmediated relation. The truth of sense certainty is rather that it's the poorest form of knowledge, that it's only <laughs> a beginning point, that it can only yield us this is in some sort of relation to each other that has yet to, to be determined in any significant concrete way. It's not really the co- most concrete form of knowledge. It's actually the most abstract. So he says, consciousness is I, nothing more appear this. The singular consciousness knows appear this or the single item. So you notice what we're doing now. We're actually sort of closing in on consciousness as a this being related now to another this and the entire universe is kind of closing in upon this upon these two this is <laughs> as all that's really happening mm. great point great stuff right here and it reminds me of uh like children again you know they might see like a baby will see an object and it's just like oh this is this is a thing right i don't really know what it is and as they develop right they start to have a relationship with the object beyond just it being an object. They think about, you know, what it can do, you know, how it tastes and all this other stuff. Um, eventually they get to a realization that they and it are separate and you have this different concepts of the self and the concept of, you know, this object or something else. You have object permanence, you know, that the object exists when it's not in your view, all this other thing. So you see this development in human, you know, kind of thought um, uh, from an early age. So I find this, you know, very, very interesting as a corollary. But when we look carefully at this pure being, which constitutes the essence of this certainty, in which this certainty pronounces to be its truth, we see that much more is involved. In actual sense, certainty is not merely this pure immediacy, but an instance of it. Mm. Among the countless differences cropping up here, we find in every case that the crucial one is that in sense certainty, pure being at once splits up into what we have called the two thises. One this as I, and the other this as object. When we reflect upon this difference, we find that neither one nor the other is only immediately present in sense certainty, but each is at the same time mediated. Mm -hmm. I have this certainty through something else, that is the thing, and it similarly is in sense certainty through something else, that is through the I. Short session, but good, good stuff. Hegel is making three important points, engaging in three important transitions, or showing us three important realizations, one right after another, in this rather short passage, section 92. I'm point them out if I remember. The immediacy, the, uh, you know, how sense certainty only really exists in that, that small moment, um, how you used to have, the, you had, the sense certainty splits off into the second one is like this, this and I, um, this, this sense of self, and stuff like that, and then I'm not sure what the third one would be. There's a lot that's that's packed in here, and if, if we want to sort of trace it in an outline, we're going from a discussion of sense certainty to a contrast between essence and example, and then a splitting between two different thises, and then we're, we're tackling the, the issue of immediacy or, or mediation. So let's look at what's going on here, since this is actually a pretty crucial point for what's happening with sense certainty. Sense certainty presents itself as if it's providing us with the pure being of things, the pure being in experience, and doing so in a way that's completely immediate. And Hegel talks now about the relation between essence and example. Now, the word essence, vasen, we can understand it in the, the classic sense of essence as sort of what is happening in, in all um, 
instances or particulars or examples, what it is that connects them all together, but also it's, it's connected with the notion of, of you know, being itself. And here's where it gets really interesting. So when we're talking about sense certainty and we're thinking about it as such, does sense certainty really have an essence? Hmm. Think about that for a moment. Try to imagine for yourself a case where you are just completely there in the moment, a passive, receptive observer of everything that's going on. Maybe you're people watching. You're just taking in the people in the crowd, and you're not really thinking. You're not trying to figure out anything about them. You're just taking it all in. Or you're at a concert, and you're just listening to the band and watching the spectacle. Or you've managed to you know, do some mindfulness training, and you're sitting down at a meal, and instead of thinking about the day or you know, about what's, gonna, what's the next course, you're just like totally there for the food and the wine or the beer or whatever you're drinking. Mm -hmm. Now, have you captured the essence of sense certainty? No. What you've done with any of those examples is precisely mm. discuss an example. Any metaphor that we can use, whether it's of, you know, the mind is mirror or still waters or anything like that, is not an essence, but just an example mm. of what the passivity or the receptivity of sense certainty would be like, the immediacy of it. You know, when you're in that, that zone, okay, we can use words like zone and we can talk about that experience, but here's the thing. It's sense certainty. Sense certainty is always going to be a matter of determinant experiences, except when we're thinking about sense certainty, when we're talking about it, when we're making it an object of our own thought. Then we can do this kind of abstraction, can't we, and talk about, yeah, man, you just need to be in the moment. You just <laughs> need to experience. Just don't put any of yourself into it. Just let the objects talk to you. <laughs> That's all rather abstract. So he says when we look at this, that's supposed to be, in essence, what we really get is a bunch of examples. We see that more is involved. An actual sense certainty, any example that we want to think of, is an example, an instance in this text, right? Beispiel in German. A particular uh, thing that we can wrap our, our heads around or our, our senses around. So he says, among the countless differences cropping up, we find in every case that the crucial one is that, in sense certainty, pure being, this pure immediacy, splits up into two things. The eye on one side, who's supposed to be experiencing passively, taking things in, could be a pure eye. And then the object, another this. And you can say, well, they're, they're really both the same because they're both this is. We don't even know that about them. <laughs> We're not that far along in our, in our investigation. But we have a splitting that's taking place, a separation. When somebody is supposed to be there just in the moment experiencing, if it's them that's there just experiencing, then it's not so you know, pure and immediate as we assumed that it was. And we can distinguish two different poles to it, two different sides to it. So he says, there's a, this is I, and the other this is object. And then when we begin to reflect on that difference, so not, not just being in the situation, but reflecting on what's going on there, we see that it's not really immediate, as we thought it was. Notice that I put immediacy versus not mediacy, but mediation. Mm. An actual mediation that's taking place. Interestingly, and this is sort of a side note too, immediacy can only be immediacy in relation to, by means of the verses, mediation, which means that there's actually a mediation going on between immediacy and mediation, which means that in a Hegelian standpoint, immediacy, anytime that you see immediacy coming up, expect that that's not going to last very long. There always is going to be some mm. sort of mediation. You don't get pure immediacy. It's just yeah. not there. Not when we analyze it, not when we pay attention to what's really going on. So what do we find out? The only time you have that immediacy is when you're not even conscious, you know, like other animals. That's what makes the difference between us and other animals is that they are immediately in the moment and they're stuck there, right? You can't, you can't, you know, think beyond that. You can't, um, not all the other animals, but some of them, right? Because um, there are some we, we know can actually think ahead, right? Can think in the future. Um, but some can't. They run on pure instinct. It's pure immediate moment. Um, I might go off topic a little bit. Uh, a good example of this is like a squirrel, right? People like to think that squirrels are actually thinking for the future, but they're not. They did studies where <laughs> um, they they realize that squirrels are just have an instinct to grab anything that's circular, right? That has that shape and, and to then dig it, right? Maybe because of some mutation or some accident happened where some, some of them accidentally dug something and then were able to find it later. Right. And you can have this complex interaction, but they actually saw that squirrels, number one, don't even know what the acorn is, right? They don't know, you know, the difference between a, a good one or a bad one. Um, they, they were able to test this because they, they put like marbles or something like that. That was just the same shape. <laughs> and they would, they would, you know, bury them just the same. Right. And then when they watched them going out and find the stuff later, right. What they saw is that they didn't know where they put it. They didn't know where they buried anything. 
it was just kind of almost randomly go around probably wasn't completely random it was probably based on like what they smell and think, stuff like that um but they were able to fool them into thinking that oh you should dig here or you should dig there um so that shows you that these squirrels weren't thinking ahead right they just didn't have any concept of future or anything like that it is just running on instinct right um but uh, a, a different animal like an elephant right they can think ahead they can think of the future they can remember you know you know where they were before you know where they got water and they could say oh we need to go there to get more water and they would hold, do a whole trek you know to get there so you can see this difference in immediacy right where it kind of depends on your level of consciousness or at least your level of you know some sort of intellect or some sort of thing that we like to uh uh call in intellect very interesting well we go back to the this eye and the this object and he says, when we reflect on this difference, I we find out that neither one nor the <laughs> other is only immediately present in sense certainty. That's not what's really happening in sense certainty. In sense certainty, this object is what it is because of the mediation of the this eye. Likewise, the this eye is what it is, able to take in the this object, able to be receptive, because of another mediation going on. Both of them are mediating each other. They're existing in what we call a relation. Mm -hmm. So it was actually no, mistaken no. to think that we had some sort of pure being that coupled the two of them together and a face difference, they fused into each other somehow. He says, um, neither one nor the other is immediately present. Each is at the same time mediated. I have this certainty, I have said certainty through something else. I'm able to have this, what seems to me, immediate experience because something else is offering that to me. If I'm eating a piece of chocolate and I say, well, this is an immediate experience. I'm just tasting chocolate now and tasting all these different, you know, things built into the thing. You know, maybe it's milk chocolate or dark chocolate or has a little bit of orange or mint in it. Who knows? I'm doing so through the actual thing. That's what's providing me with that experience. I'm not just sort of making it up inside my head. I'm having it through something else. That's not me. But the experience is occurring in me, in my consciousness. And the thing is only able to be the thing that it is and to give the possibility of, you know, the, the, those impressions to, to impinge that certainty because I'm letting it do so, mm. because I'm perceiving it, because I am involved in it. Mm -hmm. So he says, um, I have the certainty through something else, the thing. It is in self-certainty only through the I. So now we need to look a little bit more carefully at what's really going on here. Good stuff, man. Ooh. It is not just we who make this distinction between essence and instance, between immediacy and mediation. On the contrary, we find it within sense certainty itself, and it is not. It is to be taken up in the form in which it is present there, not as we have just defined it. One of the terms is posited in sense certainty in the form of a simple immediate being, whereas the essence, the object, the other, however, is posited as what is unessential and mediated, something which in sense certainty is not in itself, but through the mediation of an other, the I, a knowing mm. which knows the object only because the object is while the knowing may either be or not be. But the object is. It is what is true, or it, it is the essence. It is, regardless of whether it is known or not, and it remains even if it is not known. Whereas there is no knowledge if the object is not there. Mm. Yep, great point. In section 93, Hegel might actually appear sure. to be going back on what he just told us in section 92. But what he's doing is he's, he's backing up a little bit and saying, let's go about this and let's see where the the object of our, our investigation leads us. We know now that we're going to find all sorts of mediations happening, but let's see what sense, sense uh, certainty can reveal to us when we analyze it. So he says, it's not just we, in section 92, who make this distinction between essence and example, or instance, immediacy and mediation. We find it within sense certainty itself. So if we're paying close attention to what actually goes on within sense certainty, what it's, what it's requiring, what it's involving, then we're going to see the same, the same distinctions. He says, it's not to be taken up in the, in the, it's to be taken up in the form in which it's present there, not as we have just defined it. So we're backing off from what we did in 92, and now we're going to see how things are going on in sense certainty. So sense certainty posits, as he says, the object or the, the being as something simple, something immediate, and as something essential, as what's really going on there, as what really matters. And it's breaking up the process or the dyadic connection of sense perception into something else that then cast off and is not really being essential. As, as he says, not being immediate, only existing for something else, not in itself, but existing because of an other. And the other is the sense experience. So without, he's saying, without some sort of sense experience going on, no I. This is interesting, because normally we think about, well, I have sense experiences, and you know, I'm the one who's really calling the shots, because I'm the one who like, turns around and looks at stuff, and it's my eyeballs, or my tongue, or my skin that's taking that in. If I wasn't here, there's nothing to perceive. But sense certainty, the way that it presents itself to us at the beginning is saying, no, there's all sorts of things in the world, and whether you're there to perceive them or not, that's not really that important. 
this is where the real stuff is going on. I know I said I start talking about isn't that a shot to uh what's the name? The card or something like that, right? Uh, I think before I am thinking that that's the only certainty. <laughs> Which is this is a shot. I think I think that was um because again, this whole context is is kind of refuting, you know, a lot of the philosophers at the time, right? And I, I believe a lot of them were talking about like essentialism, right? What what the essence of things are and all this other stuff. And he's kind of like throwing shots at them. So yeah. You're just the one who happens to be along for the epistemological ride. You're the one who gets to take in the things. But what you're taking in is coming what actually is, what is true. So he'll go on and he'll say, um, this term is, is posited as, as, you know, simple immediate being as the essence. So the I is related to the, the object through knowing. But that knowing is purely contingent. It doesn't have to happen for the object to be the object, for this to already be in existence. He says, the knowing knows the object only because the object is. It is what is true, or it is the essence. It is, regardless of whether it's known or not. So if knowing doesn't take place, that's fine as far as the object is concerned. It doesn't need the knower, the I, the person, to be knowing the object. If a waterfall is there and it's flowing, it's flowing whether we actually go and perceive it or not. You know, uh, From this point of view, if the tree falls in the forest, does it make any noise? Yeah, it makes noise. It just mm -hmm. doesn't have anyone there to perceive it. Mm -hmm. There is the possibility of perception, whether somebody is actually perceiving it or not, whether somebody is knowing it or not. So he says, it remains even if it's not known. Whereas if the object's not there, there is no knowledge of the object because there's nothing to know. Mm. Great stuff. Great stuff. Throwing them shots, bro. I like it. Um, I have to run, unfortunately. Um, but this was great. Hopefully I, I remember to do this summary. <laughs> but thank you, as always, for watching, for listening. Let me know what you thought, what you learned from this section, um, what your, uh, yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> have a great day.